they're a bit like jewels buried in the landscape. Most people sort of know there's a swamp out there somewhere. But these are not places that most people want to go hanging out in. They're full of leeches and in the summertime you know, they're full of blood-sucking flies and they're full of razor sedge that cuts your fingers to pieces if you grab it. And they're full of holes you can fall into and full of mucky stuff. They're also full of a lot of amazing things which have nowhere else to live. When you think about swamps, you tend to think of them occurring in low-lying areas, but in the Blue Mountains you have hanging swamps which occur on the sides of valleys where natural instinct tells you a swamp shouldn't occur because the water should be draining away quite freely, but because of the unique geology of the Blue Mountains, they will occur on these valley sides. About seven and a half years ago, I was walking out in the Mount Hay Range, bush bush walking, and suddenly this huge dragonfly came flying past me and then turned around and came back and landed on the ground in front of me. And because I'd been involved in threatened species work, I knew what it was, I'd never seen one before. So I sat down on the ground and just, you know, half a metre away and it just sat there and I thought, hmm, I'm, I wanted to find out where it came, like what swamps, I know they breed in swamps. So I went out there a month later and I found the swamp where I thought maybe that's where it came from, a, a huge swamp, um, one of my favourite swamps. And I went in there and the place was just, there were giant dragonflies emerging everywhere and they'd never ever been recorded anywhere in the kind of numbers that I saw them in that day. So I spent four hours in the swamp watching them mating and egg laying and found burrows and made observations that people hadn't even made before. It was like, that's it, that's my mission. I need to go and find out more about giant dragonflies. So I basically spent the summer wandering across the Blue Mountains trying to identify where they occur, the different types of swamps, the distribution of the swamps, um, and get as much information and observations as I could. Sometimes you'll be walking through and there'll be dragonflies flying up. I've had them perch on my face and on my arms. They're fighting each other. There's males coming up and, you know, grappling each other in the area in aerial combat. But the really interesting thing about them is that the larvae dig burrows quite deep down into the peaty soils, into the groundwater. Most of these swamps, once you take a core sample, you generally find that they're about between two and three metres deep, the peat, and that's probably taken 15 to 20,000 years to develop. It's very important that we preserve that peat substrate. That's, that's really critical. So this is a pretty good example of a fairly boggy piece of um, this swamp soil. It's not a lot of really um, well-defined peat. It's very, old, very decomposed sort of muck peat. But you can actually see, we're talking about the amount of water that gets held in these um, soils and the kind of functioning as um, sponges. That it's actually, you know, um, so there's a huge amount of stuff stored in here. You know, this goes down for, you know, a couple of metres at least. Um, and although it looks like a big piece of boggy muck, it's actually full of all sorts of small invertebrates and worms. Um, somewhere in here there's crayfish burrowing in here, giant dragonflies, larvae. So essentially what you're looking at, even though you can't see it, is like a very large lake or body of water. The peat material in the swamp can actually hold up to 10 times its dry weight in water. So it holds all that water so that it comes in from the surrounding catchment and it can actually hold it within the landscape and then slowly release it down over the waterfalls into the streams. And so they're very important in maintaining steady flows of water in our catchments here. So they act like a giant filter within the landscape. What comes out the other end is of a much higher quality and that feeds then into the, into the broader natural environment and down into the World Heritage Area and into the National Park. They appear to be quite resilient as long as they're wet. Fire goes over the top, it's like a, a bit like a haircut. Um, this swamp was burnt out five years ago, but it had very little damage to the peat because even although it was a bit of a dry time, it was, there was still quite a lot of moisture in the soil. A resilient system can be exposed to change, but it can maintain its integrity and function in the face of that change. 
So it's a very important um, aspect because change is always occurring. Some change are human induced, some are short term climatic, and then of course we have the threat of long term climatic change. The Blue Mountain Swamps are listed as a vulnerable endangered ecological community, which is in recognition of their rarity and their vulnerability to ongoing threats. So if those threats aren't addressed, then in the future it's likely that they'll become more and more rare and potentially no longer exist in the landscape. By running um, the particular climate change scenario, putting in the dates you want to look at, you can see where the boundaries of these swamps could potentially shrink to. It shows the most vulnerable swamps and it also shows um, an overall potential for significant loss of the asset across the mountains. With that, we'd lose not only their hydrological functions, which are very important, but there's also the community itself, the assemblage of species that occur within a Blue Mountain Swamp are a unique assemblage of species. And they are also home to a variety of really important threatened species, such as the endangered giant dragonfly. There are animals, small and large, crawling around, eating stuff, living their lives, growing up, um, and they're all dependent on groundwater. If the water table drops down too far or, and stays down for too long, those species are going to be threatened. This is what is called channelisation of a swamp. It's obviously the water's taking the easiest course and it, it, it drains the swamp of water and without water, it won't support the same vegetation. Different species will, will occur, weeds will invade it and there you have a loss of swamp. And there's another channel, we'll walk across another channel, so it's quite common in these urban interface swamps. A lot of the urbanisation in the Blue Mountains is formed along the main central ridge line of the Blue Mountains Plateau and the stormwater that's generated from all the hard surfaces, the concrete, the asphalt, etc, tends to run off to the low-lying areas and into the valleys and it can very easily channelise through swamp systems. By essentially making them as robust and in, in as natural a state as possible, then that's going to give swamps the best chance in the face of climate change. The Swamp Care program uh, has resulted in over 10,000 hours of volunteer time being donated over the last five years to protect these swamp systems. So I think that just gives you an indication of just how passionate people are about this. I think it makes a big difference. You can. You can see, you know, you can't, might come back and there's still some weeds there, but nothing like what, what it was. And I'm always amazed at, at how, you know, a morning's work just now and again can make such a big difference. The Hawksman Repair and Catchment Management Authority thought about what could we do in the future to um, help these systems absorb the impacts of climate change without changing too much themselves. And really, there are no magic bullets. What What's happening now is really the sort of management that will have to happen in the future, but perhaps more so, perhaps more people involved, because the, the vulnerabilities that are here now are also the future vulnerabilities, so if we can act to repair the current damage to swamps, it just increases their resilience to the predicted impacts of climate change. This little, um, this little stream... So apart from the times when it's been 35 degrees all day and I've been walking in the full sun and covered in blood, um, even those times I actually enjoy because um, I feel like, you know, you feel like you're, you're there, you're in the swamp and you're present with what the swamp is about. Um, so, yeah, yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I've never regretted it, but, yeah. Oh, drats. You got it. Yeah, you can go for a few hours thinking, I'm going very well here. And then suddenly you just watch out for the hole down there. Oh, my right foot is absolutely saturated. <laughs>